Hello, mind mappers, and welcome to the video. Today, we're going to be going over Smart Cuts by Shane Snow, How Hackers, Innovators, and Icons Accelerate Their Success, a book all about getting where you want to go in as efficient way as possible. Shane's not only done a really good job sharing some smart cuts that we can implement in our own lives to make our journey more efficient, but he's also shared some really great stories of people who you probably know that have used smart cuts to get where they are today. And with that, let's get directly into the introduction of the book. I've pulled out a quote here that I believe gives us a good overview of what we can expect to learn. Shane says, pick your era of history and you'll find a handful of people across industries and continents who buck the norm and do incredible things in implausibly short amounts of time. Of course, that's what we're all looking for, right? We want to do it incredible things, maybe not in plausibly short amount of times, but we definitely want to get there in as efficient way as possible. The common pattern is that, like computer hackers, certain innovators break convention to find better routes to stunning accomplishments. The question is, can finding these better routes be taught, or is it kind of an innate ability of those people? In this book, I'm going to show you how overachievers throughout history have applied lateral thinking to success in a variety of fields and endeavors. In doing this, I plan to convince you that the fastest route to success is never traditional and that conventions we grow up with can be hacked. And most important, I want to show you anyone, not just billionaires, entrepreneurs, and professional mavericks can speed up progress in business or in life. So again, this book is all about how to do incredible things in a short amount of time. That's really what Smart Cuts is all about. And we'll talk more about Smart Cuts in a little bit. But here today, we're going to be bucking the norm and not following conventional wisdom in a well thought out and deliberate way. So we're not doing it just to be different. We're doing it in a way that ideally is going to lead to some of the success and results that the people this book was written about have achieved doing things that people often believe not to be possible. But it doesn't just need to be for people who are interested in shooting rockets to Mars, right? Of course, when we think of mavericks and billionaire entrepreneurs, we all think of Elon Musk. Smart Cuts is for you. It's for me. It's for whatever role we play. Accomplishing something incredible with your life that has meaning to you as quickly as possible. And that could look completely different from one person to the next. For one, it might be shooting rockets to Mars, and another one, it might just be being an amazing family person. This book is filled with that type of wisdom. And of course, Shane references people like Benjamin Franklin, Elon Musk, and Sherlock Holmes. But we don't need to be Benjamin Franklin, Elon Musk, and Sherlock Holmes to still be able to use smart cuts in our own life. Smart cuts are going to give us more time and they're going to help us achieve what we want to achieve in the most efficient manner. Before we get into a little bit more about what smart cuts are, let's talk about mind mapping. Get the most out of these mind maps by following along. You can find the process of how I mind map plus all 50 plus mind map templates completely for free, all at the link down below. Following along will help you learn more, remember better, and apply these books to your life. And if you're looking for an even further shortcut, or you're looking for a further synthesization of information such as this, you can find my masterclasses on the mindmapguide.com. Essentially, those are a shortcut to any particular topic that you might be interested in, the best wisdom that I've found on that subject. Things like mind mapping, learning, habits, and goal setting are all masterclasses available on the mindmapguide.com. With that, let's get directly into smart cuts. The difference between Franklin's unconventional work and Abagnale's was the former managed to create value for others while the latter cheated others. So directly, we're going to get into the difference between smart cuts and shortcuts. Franklin's approach was a lateral solution to the unfairness of present convention. Abagnale's, however, entertaining, was a con and he paid for it. Abagnale is who... Catch Me If You Can, the movie, the big movie, Catch Me If You Can, that's who it's based after. He was kind of a magician, a trickster, a con artist. And that's the difference between rapid and short-term gains, which I call shortcuts and sustainable success achieved quickly through smart work or smart cuts. 
Whereas by dictionary definition, shortcuts can be immoral, you can think of smart cuts as shortcuts with integrity, working smarter and achieving more without creating negative externalities. And that's really what this is all about, right? Sometimes when we take shortcuts, we often think of shortcuts as a way to kind of skirt the line or, or get ahead without really putting in the work. And smart cuts are not about that. Smart cuts, you're still going to need to put in the work, but it's about working smarter, not harder. It's about making sure that you're accomplishing things in as an efficient way as possible, again, without creating negative externalities or, for example, making life worse off for someone else. Accomplishing something in an efficient manner is what this is all about, generally by working smarter and avoiding the path that others have staked and understanding the pitfalls that others fall into. So that's kind of the first part of smart cuts. Number one, we have to know that we're not going to follow the same path that everyone has laid out in front of us if that's not the path that we're trying to take. Just because everyone else has a particular path that they continue to follow doesn't mean that that's the path that we need to follow. So that's kind of the first part of smart cuts is being willing to buck the trend, but not just because you're bucking the trend, buck the trend because you know that there's a different way to accomplish something. Smart cuts are generally lateral thinking instead of straight line linear moves. So you're not necessarily just kind of charging straight forward into the fray and trying to accomplish something through just sheer hard work. You're looking for lateral moves, ways that are going to make your path a little bit less traveled and perhaps make it a little bit quicker. They're also not shortcuts, and in fact, we should beware of shortcuts. Shortcuts are often immoral and lead us into trouble. Think late night infomercials selling some kind of six pack solution. They don't work and you lose quite a lot of money. The person selling them is taking a shortcut and so are you. So it's just a bad transaction overall. Most of all, smart cuts are a new way of thinking, new for us in particular. As we saw before, Elon Musk, Benjamin Franklin, Sherlock Holmes, they're all smart cut thinkers. This is not new in the world of success. Looking at the situation from the ground up instead of the predetermined path, that's what this is all about. Just because someone else has drawn a map for you doesn't mean that's the quickest route. Asking yourself how you could accomplish something faster using different skills or leverage your past success. So that's kind of maybe the first part of smart cuts. And we'll talk about this a little bit later is let's step back. What advantages do I have? Let's step back. What path have others taken? And can I see a quicker one in my future? This book is filled with a ton of great smart cut examples. That's what the rest of our points are all about. I advise that we test them. We apply them to our lives. And if they work, we reuse them. Smart cuts are not something that we have to only use one time. We can constantly be iterating on them and continuing to make them better. So our first big idea here that I've highlighted in this kind of cream color is bigger or better. Really great idea. Now, if the BYU kids had gone door to door asking for free televisions, they wouldn't have succeeded so quickly. What a great hook line that is. Few people are willing to make that kind of stretch. Imagine someone knocking on your door and asking you for a free television. This is like an intern applying for a CEO job or a brand new startup bidding on a NASA contract. The players eliminate resistance by breaking the big challenge, acquire something valuable like a TV into a series of easier and repeatable tasks. For example, making a tiny trade. So what are we talking about here? Researchers call this psychology of small wins, gamblers, on the other hand, would call it a parlay, which the dictionary defines as cumulative series of bets in which winnings accrued from each transaction are used as a stake for a further bet. So essentially, we're talking about a experiment that some kids from BYU did, where essentially they started out at one house party at the night, and they had a toothpick. And they kind of consistently traded up and traded up and traded up. And at the end of the night, a few of them actually had televisions. So they traded up from a toothpick to a stick of gum. They traded from a stick of gum to maybe a $5 bill, something like that, right? So they continued to trade up and trade up and trade up. And eventually they went from a toothpick to a television, which is pretty amazing. And bigger or better, the parlay never stops. 
Players don't wait an arbitrary period of time before moving on to the next trade, and they don't mind if the result of the trade was only a slightly more desirable object, so long as the game keeps moving. So that's the idea, right? You don't have to necessarily make sure that you're trading from a toothpick up to something as valuable as even a laptop or even something smaller than that. You just need something a little bit better than a toothpick because the next deal that you go, that little bit better than a toothpick is going to make your ability to make your next deal a little bit better. Even if it's a lateral move that maybe the objects are technically worth the same monetary value, if it's a lateral move but it makes it slightly more desirable, that might be a good move for you to do in the game of bigger or better. And I'm not sure if you guys have seen this, but there's also a YouTube video where a guy trades, starts with a penny and trades up all the way to a house. And then he trades it a few dozen times. I, I, I forget exactly how many times he traded it, but he went from like a penny to a paperclip. And after a few dozen trades, he traded something for a house. It seems totally implausible. But Shane gives us another story of those BYU kids doing the same exact thing. Going from a toothpick to a TV in only one night seems completely implausible as well. Of course, trading a toothpick for a TV is probably not a shortcut that you want to take. It doesn't seem like a good use of our time, but it certainly is a very good representation of something important here. I think of it like real-world compound interest, leveraging one move that you make to help you move again without a time limit. So this is consistently taking on new projects at work or consistently taking on new clients at your job that are going to make you better and make you more attractive for the next deal that you make. So bigger or better is the game that we're consistently playing in our professional lives. And it's a really great way to think of it because it constantly keeps your eyes pinned for where can I make my next move. And I'm not going to wait an arbitrary amount of time. So say, for example, I just got this client and it's a big client that I have never um, done that type of work for them before. I'm not going to wait even a minute before I try and go and get my next client and tell them I'm working with this client. So Bigger or Better is a game that we can consistently play in business. It's a game that we can, can consistently play in our jobs as well. Now, moving from job to job might not be the exact right thing for you to do, but you can certainly move from project to project within your job and consistently ask for more responsibility. So for example, right now you might be stuck in a job that you don't love. Plus, you've probably got one that you would like in your mind. That job might be something that you're currently unqualified for. That second job that you know that you want might be something you're unqualified for. So what can you do? Start trading toothpicks. What's a small jump that you can make right now move you in the direction of your dream job? So this isn't even necessarily, like I said, moving positions because constantly asking to move positions or constantly moving from company to company might have some negative effects. Those might be quote unquote shortcuts, but a smart cut would be consistently asking for more responsibility, consistently ask for new projects, consistently ask for some feedback from your boss or from your manager, those types of things, consistently looking to get better, stack up and stack up and stack up and stack up because you're not only building trust with your management staff or with your boss, but you're also building skills. And all you need to do is continually repeat that. And again, after you've done one project or after you've had one review, don't wait an arbitrary amount of time to actually go on to the next one ask for more feedback, ask for more projects, and continue to deliver. When you're able to do that, you're going to be able to move up much, much faster. And your career, your job, it really just becomes a big game of bigger or better, which actually seems like a heck of a lot of fun. Next, we're gonna talk about progress. So how does one avoid billionaire's depression? or regular person stuck in a dead-end job, lack of momentum, fueled depression. Harvard Business School professor Teresa took, a, took on the question in the mid-2000s in a research study of white-collar employees. She tasks 238 pencil pushers in various industries to keep daily work diaries. The workers answered open-ended questions about how they felt and what events in their day stood out. And so 
as her and her fellow researchers then dissected 12,000 resulting entries, searching for patterns in what affects people's inner work lives most dramatically. The answer, it turns out, is simply progress, a sense of forward momentum. Everything that we want in life is really a sense of forward motion, regardless of how small, and that's the interesting part. They found that minor victories at work were nearly as psychologically powerful as major breakthroughs. So in other words, trading up from, a, for example, a toothpick to a stick of gum is as nice as trading from a television to a house, for example. So really one of the quotes that I just love is that success is really just a progressive realization of a, a worthy goal. It's not the end point. It's not the beginning, the dead end job. It's the middle. It's about the journey. Humans are wired for progress. We crave it and it makes us happy. So how are you building progress into your life? It's a good time to stop and reflect upon that. Do you know what direction you're heading in? Can you feel yourself playing the game of bigger or better? Or have you been stuck at the stick of gum for quite a while now? Do you have a way of measuring how far you've come? Do you remember where you first started out with that toothpick? Or do you remember what, when you first started out as a dishwasher or wherever you are? Are you actively looking backwards and saying, you know what, I've come a long way. Do you know what your ne next toothpick trade might look like? So we want to know what direction we're heading in, but we also want to know what type of trade we're looking for next. Do we know what our next one step forward is going to be? Do we know if we're going to ask for feedback from our boss? Do we know if we're going to ask for a more one-on-one -on -one time with our boss? Do we know if we're going to ask for more projects to take on, for more responsibility? Momentum is a powerful tool, and it's all about building it into our life. We spoke about real-world compound interest already through our bigger and better exercise. That's a powerful lever for success, but it turns out it also is a profoundly motivating and happy-making tool. Moving forward 1% each day or making one small trade each day towards our worthy goal is the best thing that we can do for our own personal happiness. So keep in mind that the game of bigger or better is not necessarily just things that are going to make us more successful in business, but it also is going to make us more happy. And Sonia Lubomirsky actually talks about this in her book, Myths of Happiness, how momentum, not necessarily the end goal, is the thing that truly makes us happy. And that small wins are almost better for happiness than big wins are because of hedonic adaptation. I recommend you go check out that book, The Myths of Happiness by Sonia Lipomirsky. Really great book, profoundly perspective changing around all of the myths that were told about happiness. Next, let's talk about feedback. This is another very important point. Crucially, experts tended to be able to turn off the part of their egos that took legitimate feedback personally when it came to their craft. And they were confident enough to parse helpful feedback from incorrect feedback. Meanwhile, novice, novices psyched themselves out. They needed encouragement and feared failure. The tough part about negative feedback is in separating ourselves from the perceived failure of turning our experiences into ob objective experiments. But when we do that, feedback becomes much more powerful. The second city teaches students to take such things, failures in stride to become scientists who see audience reactions as commentary on the joke and not the jokester, to turn off the part of their brains that says, I fail when they get negative feedback. With this process, the second city transforms failure, which is something that implies finality, into feedback, something that can be used to improve hundreds of times a week. So this is all about learning to see failure as feedback. And one really great way that's kind of hidden in this quote here is actually just to use your experience and turn it into an experiment. I love that experience to experiment. So for example, if you're trying to start a new business, make it a game, make it a game of bigger or better, make it a game of just let's try this out and see how it goes. Don't take things personally. Because even if you fail, it's not saying anything about you, it's saying something about the tactics that you used. And in that way, we can turn failure into feedback. 
Every person at the top of their field has failed hundreds, if not thousands of times. There is one thing that sets them apart. They don't see it as failure. They see it as feedback, something they can use to improve on their craft versus a reason to stop. Second City is an improv comedy academy that thrives on failure. The Second City teaches those students to actually see failure in stride. Don't actually see it as, oh, the joke has to be over because people didn't get it or don't, you know, if you say banana when you should have said telephone, it's not a failure. It's a way to actually get feedback from the audience and you're kind of continually getting better and better and better through the feedback from the audience. It really is great. And in this way, we actually want to seek out as much feedback as possible in our lives. Remember, we talked about before how asking for feedback at your job is one of the best ways that you can trade a toothpick for a stick of gum. You can continually ask how you could be getting better and getting better and getting better. And that's going to be putting you ahead because most people are afraid of feedback because when they get negative feedback, they see it as a failure instead of a way to learn. I'm blessed that I've taken a path in life that has involved quite a lot of failure. An entrepreneur since the age of 18, I've definitely had my fair share. Now, one thing that I've been blessed with is a brain that seems to be not wired to take failure as a reason to stop, but there have been many times that I wanted to. Here's a process that I now use to automatically and immediately turn my failures into feedback. It's a three-step process. And what I'm doing now is I open up a spreadsheet or a piece of paper that has two different columns. One for the thing that I failed at or I don't know enough about. So for example, if someone asks me a question in my marketing business and I don't actually know the answer to it, I'll write it down in that one column. The other one for resources where I can learn more about it. I have time dedicated to my calendar that actually says go into this spreadsheet and find some resources that you can learn more about that thing. Number two, when I fail or I don't know the answer to something related to my goal or to my business or what I want to accomplish, write it down and call it number one. And here's the important part. You need to forget about it. Writing it down so you can revisit it later takes a lot of weight off your shoulders. And immediately and quickly, as fast as we possibly can, we want to move from that feedback, which might turn into a failure if we let it kind of fester in our minds. We want to take it from feedback to action, feedback to action as quickly as we possibly can. And writing it down in the spreadsheet was the fastest way that I found to do that. And number three, I kind of jumped the gun a little bit is I mark some time on my calendar for learning. I have two hours every single week that I use to learn. Spend some time that finding resources and some of it learning the new skills that are inside of the spreadsheet that you've actually created for yourself. You've kind of now turned feedback into, you've turned failure, for example, into feedback and into development. Now, you've gone exactly from failure to action, failure to action, and cutting that curve is one of the best things that you can do for your own personal development. After all, we can read as many books as we want, we can watch as many videos as we want. The real way that we learn as human beings is through experience. So the more you can take that failure in your experience and turn it into learnings, the quicker you're going to learn and the quicker you're going to be better. Our next idea here is called overnight. As we've learned from Michelle Fan's story, the secret to harnessing momentum is to build up potential energy so that expected opportunities can be amplified. On the playground, it's like building a tower to stand on. You can start your Olympic ring with more velocity and Fan's tower was a backlog of quality content. This is how innovators like Sal Khan, who created Khan Academy and published more than a thousand math lessons online before being discovered by Bill Gates, who thrust him into the spotlight and propelled him to build a groundbreaking digital academy. And musicians like Rodriguez, a folk singer who's amazing but was largely unrecognized music until the 1970s, was featured in a 2012 documentary, which then catapulted him to world fame he became an overnight success. None of them were overnight successes, but each of their backlogs became reservoirs ready to become torrents as soon as the dam was removed. So we've talked about this quite a lot before, but the idea here is that there's no overnight successes, whether this is career or business, 
The myth of the overnight success is pervasive. Everyone thinks that the people that are successful, like the musicians, like the business people, they think it just happened for them all at once. And of course, some of us know that that's not actually true. People who aren't actually attempting to accomplish something seem to believe that those who do it didn't work for it, right? There's a myth that they got lucky, which of course isn't ever really true. People who do experience overnight success are the ones that you've actually already forgotten about. They may have had one great video and actually got lucky. They might have had one great song or book, but they didn't have staying power and they eventually faded away. The attention isn't the hard part of succeeding. It's actually a great degree up to a little bit of luck and kind of things coming together all at the right time. Having quality work to back it up, that's the difficult part. You can't just have one successful video. You can't just have one successful article. You need to have an entire backlog because if you do have one successful video or article, you're going to lose all of your fans because all of the rest of them are no good. This is meant to be motivating, right? But how? Most of us think that if we're not an overnight success, it's not going to happen for us. And that's simply not true. If you commit to something for the long term, your chances of becoming an overnight success go up dramatically. Plus, once you get there, you'll actually be good at what you do and you'll keep all of your fans. So if you want a smart cut, commit to the long term and show your work if possible. That's really what I'm doing with this YouTube channel as well, right? I'm extremely grateful for the amount of people that have actually come and joined the channel. It's been honestly pretty overwhelming. But the one thing that I will say is that I'm continually building up this big backlog. And I know that one video is just going to hit and we're going to catapult up to some of the really big channels that are here on YouTube. But I'll have a huge backlog so that all of the great new people that join the channel will have a ton of great wisdom and insight coming from these books to be able to follow along with. And hopefully they'll stick around like some of you have. Let's talk about our next point, which is simple. Like Sherlock Holmes, hackers strip, strip away the unnecessary from their lives. They zero in on what matters. Like great writers, innovators have the fortitude to cut the adverbs. This is why Apple founder Steve Jobs' closet was filled with dozens of identical black turtlenecks in Levi's 501 jeans. To simplify his choices, U.S. presidents do the same thing. You'll see I wear only gray or blue shirts, President Barack Obama told Michael Lewis for his October 2012 Vanity Fair cover story. I don't want to make decisions about what I'm eating or wearing because I have too many other things to make decisions about. So the idea here is that successful people often live very simple lives, and we think of billionaires and business magnates and mavericks as being kind of these eccentric people with eccentric tastes. And it's not because they don't like fancy clothes or have a million options that these people tend to leave very simple lives. It's because they understand that attention and energy are both limited resources, perhaps the most limited resources that we have on earth. They understand that every second spent picking out an outfit is a second not working on their dream. And does this mean that you need to wear the same shirt every single day and eat the same meal every single day? No, of course not. But what you do need to do is decide what's important to you. Do you care about fashion? Well, that's great. Spend some of your time and energy there. Do you care about amazing food? Great. Spend your time there. The idea here is to understand what's important to you and then do your best to pre-decide things that tend to get in the way of you focusing on those things. So if business is extremely important to you and fashion is kind of at the bottom of your list, just buy the same t-shirt and, and have the same jeans. That's one way to go about it. If, for example, you're really interested in fashion, but you know you want to get on with your day and food really is just fuel to you. Make sure that you're pre-planning your meals or make sure that you're eating kind of a similar thing each day. Here's a great place to start. Number one is to look at your day currently. What time do you get up and what decisions do you make? What drains your energy throughout the day? Kind of take an overall view of what your day generally looks like. Next, you want to look at the pieces that could be put on autopilot. It's If it's your clothes, for example, great. If it's your food in the morning, Great. If it's your entire morning routine that can be kind of scripted out step by step, that's great as well. 
You want to write down what your new day will look like and set yourself up to have as much decision power for the important and spend as little time on the unimportant as possible. Now, again, this is going to look different for everyone. You know, there's so many Instagram accounts out there, uh, or there was at least when I was using Instagram that are telling you the exact morning routine of billionaires or millionaires. That's not going to be your same routine. What you need to do is take a look at your life and see how you can simplify it so that there's more room for the complex. Our final point here today is about fruit, the high hanging fruit approach to be specific. The big swing is more technically challenging than going after low hanging fruit, but the diminished number of competitors in the upper branches, not to mention the necessary expertise of those that make it that high provides fuel for 10 X thinking and brings out potential. Big causes attract big believers, big investors, big capital, big name advisors, and big talent. They force us to rethink convention and hack the ladder of success. To engage with masters and to leverage waves of platforms and super connectors, to swing and to simplify, to quickly turn failure into feedback, and to become not just bigger, but truly better. And they remind us once again that Together we can achieve the implausible. And this is really just a call to action to all of us to do something big, because why not? This is the only chance we get. Human beings are amazing and we've created an amazing society. This is in large part due to the dreamers, the people out there who are willing to think big and put themselves on the line. These people are attractive and we want to give our best selves to those people and to help them accomplish their big ideas. A smart cut? Be that person. Dream big. Attract high-level people. Play your best game. Or at the very least, find a place that you can do that, even if it's a part of a team. Thanks for being with me here today. This was Smart Cuts by Shane Snow. Once again, if you're looking to do a little bit of a smart cut yourself and kind of get the synthesized information on several different topics like mind mapping, learning, habits, and goal setting, you can find my master classes where I've synthesized the biggest ideas, the best ideas from all the books that I've read on the topic at themindmapguy.com. This was Smart Cuts by Shane Snow. Thanks for being with me here today, and I hope to see you in the next one.